ど。The Bible called them plagues. Today we call them natural disasters, but they're actually one and the same. And the biblical plagues are coming back. Locusts, the ultimate Bible plague. For thousands of years, locusts have tormented humanity, destroying entire harvests in hours. For almost as long, we have been trying desperately to fight them. But even today, with all that modern science and technology can offer, it's far from clear who is winning. Egypt, 1,500 BC. The pharaoh was building a new royal city. He needed workers, and he used the people of Israel as slaves. After generations of oppression, the people of Yahweh demanded their freedom, but Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go. Moses warned Pharaoh that the Lord would visit plagues upon the land of Egypt. The Nile turned to blood, the fish died. Insects tormented people and animals. Storms and hail lashed the earth. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. So the Lord sent a further plague, locusts. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt, and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will they ever be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and the fruit on the trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. I think we should just imagine that locusts just swarmed everywhere. There'd be literally millions of locusts. And this is what we've seen today. So we see this today, the locusts just swarm everywhere. They cover every square centimeter or every square inch of ground. Um, and they just would have been this awful plague, which would have been eating everything in, in, in their path. And so there'll be no plants left, no leaves on trees, a really terrible plague. Africa today, a land attacked by plagues of locusts. This could be Mauritania or Morocco, Algeria or Sudan, Chad or Mali. Pictures of an all too familiar horror. In all the countries bordering the Sahara, swarms of locusts descend on wide areas of farmland and devour the harvests. They bring famine. In a single day, they can consume food crops that hundreds of thousands of people are depending on. The nightmare returns every 10 to 20 years. African farmers despair of finding a way to fight back. They have no way of combating the locusts. Every time, the locusts leave a wasteland behind them. The University of Halle in Germany. For years, Professor Hans-Jörg Ferenc 
has investigated ways of combating the locust. He has visited the scene of locust plagues many times. He knows the importance of understanding locust behavior. Die Heuschrecken sind wahre Reproduktionsmaschinen, wenn sie genug zu fressen bekommen. Die Umweltbedingungen stimmen, dann können sie also enorme Mengen an Nachkommen innerhalb kürzester Zeit produzieren. Und äh, dieses, äh, die, dieses Verhalten der Tiere in, in Schwarm, wie vermehren sie sich, äh, wie, wie wird das reguliert, wie kommunizieren die Tiere, wie finden sie zueinander, wie sichern die Männchen äh, trotz hoher Konkurrenz ihre Vaterschaft. Das sind so Fragen, die uns interessieren und an denen wir hier mit moderner Technologie arbeiten. In Germany, locusts are actually a protected species. Yet Germany is also at the forefront of anti-locust research. Scientists in the industrialized countries feel a particular responsibility, as they alone have the scientific knowledge and the financial means to pursue the research. Locust plagues are not found only in the developing countries of Africa and elsewhere, but also in wealthy industrialized countries. Australia, a vast country with a relatively small population. 20 million people live in a continent about the size of Europe. Much of the soil has been depleted by excessive land clearing. This, together with drought, is causing serious problems for an otherwise prosperous land. Wayne Burnett runs a 2,000 hectare property near Ense in Victoria's East Gippsland. Despite the size of his property, Wayne's paddocks can barely feed his 350 head of cattle. Especially since he recently faced a new problem, locusts. This is the first time I've ever had anything to do with them. Oh, well, we had big swarms come in before Christmas. Then two days they were here real thick. Um, oh, no. Yeah, it was just you were walking through masses of them the whole time. They were just around you like snowflakes. Yeah, it was like a living snowstorm when they were here. You can see what they've eaten here. You see that what they've chewed out. And um, there's a couple of patches in the hay paddock there. You can see the difference in the grass where they've eaten and where the green grass is. Well, if they kept going, if we hadn't killed them, there'd be no grass left in the paddock. The locusts ate almost everything. Wayne had to use his feed reserves or his cattle would have starved to death. Locusts are native to Australia and plagues are common in the inland. Some blame global warming for bringing them to East Gippsland. Craig Lloyd has an organic farm 20 kilometers from Wayne's property. He hoped the locusts would not reach him. He already had enough on his plate with soil erosion and bushfires. But shortly before Christmas 2005, he too was hit by the locust plague. I've been on this farm for nearly 12 years now. This is the first time I've ever seen the plague locusts. And they're here by the absolute trillions. Oh, it wasn't right, so I was looking from over here and I thought there'd been a big thunderstorm and there's just this black mass coming down the hill. And they were just eating all before them. It just looked like a wash of water. Just start and demolish everything in front of them. It's just like the earth has been burnt. They just eat everything and just leave a dirt path behind them. Craig, too, had to buy in cattle feed to survive. The locusts had gone, the paddocks recovered, 
and the farmers could only hope that the locusts never came back to the valley. But Wayne made a terrible discovery. The locusts had gone, but they had left the next generation behind them. Yeah, they're, they're eggs. A single locust can produce up to 200 offspring. How can the eggs survive in this desiccated earth? And why do they lay so many eggs in one place? At the University of Hulla, an experiment is in progress to observe the mating behavior of locusts. The male approaches the female and mounts her while she digs a hole behind her using the pincers attached to her abdomen. Before laying her eggs, the female prepares the hole. She fills it with a mysterious secretion of foam. Hier sieht man jetzt sehr schön, wie das Heuschreckenweibchen beginnt, den Eischaum zu produzieren und dabei die Eier abzulegen. Pro Gelege befinden sich ca. 70 Eier und das Heuschreckenweibchen bildet in ihrem Leben ca. dreimal solch ein Eigelege. Nicole Reichenbach has discovered that the foam protects the eggs from drying out, so the eggs can survive in extremely dry or sandy soil. The foam also contains a disinfectant, and it hardens and seals the eggs, protecting them from predators. Finally, the foam contains a scent that attracts other locusts to lay their eggs in the same place. When the locusts hatch, there is safety in numbers. There are so many that no possible predator can account for them all. So drought offers no protection against locusts. The brood survived the drought conditions in Victoria. After a few weeks, the result is already obvious. Hundreds of thousands of tiny hoppers have hatched and are buzzing around looking for food. They are still too small to fly. It will be a few days yet before there's any danger of a swarm. But they're already destroying grass by the ton. A locust eats its own weight every day. That's only one or two grams, but there are millions of them per square kilometer. The same thing has happened on Craig Lloyd's farm. So it's disappointing to see that there's thousands of locusts back here. At first, the farmers were left to their own devices. The state government had little experience of dealing with locusts and told the farmers to look after their own land. But when the swarms came back, the government set up an emergency hotline. Yep. So, Wayne, you have locusts located on your property? Yeah, we do, eh? Whereabouts are they? Oh, mostly on the north side, from the east to the west end. I have been um, doing them, as I found, small bands, but they're really getting here in large numbers now. 6 a.m. at the nearby town of Swifts Creek. The usual task of this group is to fight and control bushfires. With increasing reports of hatching locusts, the authorities have decided to assess the scale of the problem by collecting samples from different locations. 
Each group member is given a plastic container to fill with locusts. The field officers will visit every farmer. That means a lot of driving. Ibises prey on locusts. There are far too few of them to make any difference to the coming swarms, but they are an indicator. The men know they'll find locusts wherever ibises are gathering. Here too, most of the locusts are still at the hopper stage. They'll have to grow a lot bigger before they develop wings. They need another six weeks to build up reserves of fat. These allow them to fly long distances between feeds. Back at the University of Halle, they are breeding the dreaded swarming locusts. Every morning, the locusts are fed specially grown green grass. The laboratory assistant is wearing a mask because years of work with locusts have left her with a serious allergy. Each cage contains locusts at a different stage of development. Every day, the cages are cleaned, the water is changed, and fresh food is provided. The locusts can look quite different. They have different colors, different sizes. Some have wings and some do not. Under certain conditions, solitary locusts can turn into swarming locusts, which fly and keep together. Man hat die beiden Formen, die solitäre und diese schwarmbildende, diese gregäre Form nennen wir das, die hat man für verschiedene Arten gehalten, bis dann klar war, dass hier wir eine Art in zwei verschiedenen Phasenzuständen haben. The transition to the swarming phase depends partly on the density of the locust population. That is, on whether the insects are physically close enough to each other and partly on the lushness or sparseness of the vegetation. Victoria. Even at the hopping stage, the task force is already spraying the roads with insecticide. The insects still can't travel far by themselves, but the task force has to make sure that trucks and cars don't pick them up in their tire treads. At all costs, the locusts must be kept from spreading to other areas. The sprayers are hoping to keep Australia from the fate that overtook biblical Egypt. The first three plagues of Egypt left the Egyptians with no fish to eat, their cattle were sick and hailstones flattened their flax and barley fields. Then locusts cut a swathe of destruction through their remaining grain supplies. In Africa, they are called the teeth of the wind. The Egyptians had no idea of what they could do. I think the ancient Egyptians would have done what they could. I think they would have rushed outside, they would have hit the locusts with sticks, they may have lit fires to burn them and keep them away, um, they may have thrown water on them, they would have done what they could. 
But ultimately, there's just no defence against millions of locusts landing on your soil. So I think the locusts then would have taken over and just have eaten everything. In Victoria, the task force responds to more and more locust sightings. They've now called in entomologists to examine the especially critical areas, which were spared before because the vegetation was too sparse and dry to attract the locusts. But ibises, the natural predators of locusts, have been spotted as well. Their presence is an unmistakable pointer to locusts. There seem to be fewer locusts here. The experts can't catch a single one. But the locusts have left their calling card, damaged grass. So with, with loosen, they'll cut the petiole and just drop the leaf on the ground. Okay. Slant face, it's called. And it comes in brown and green. Wayne Burnett shows the field officer the so-called hopper bands on his farm. Dark lines of young hopping locusts that are denuding the grass. At the same time, the insect experts land in the paddock. They've come to check the locusts' stage of development. They drag their nets along the dark lines of insects, which promptly disappear as the locusts flee. Yet the scientists still get a frighteningly large haul. In the laboratory, the experts check the development stage of all the locusts that have been collected. They discover locusts at every stage of development. That's bad news. When they spray the locusts, they have to be sure to kill as many as possible before they grow wings. Once the locusts can fly, it's too late. But if they start too early, they miss the locusts that hatch later. They must act at exactly the right time. This has got wings, he's able to fly quite significantly and during the day it will fly at heights of three to four metres. It will fly distances of up to 40 kilometres a day, speeds of, of eight to 10 kilometres an hour, which means that it is very difficult to, to spray it, particularly using ground-based equipment. So you're really trying to control before they become adult. Craig Lloyd hopes the locusts can be controlled without using too many chemicals. As an organic farmer, He's proud of his dung beetles. That species of the dung beetle is actually one that I introduced three years ago, so dung beetle's working. He wants to get back in his dung. <laughs> and you can see him go back in the dung. An activity there, so that's really good. For the moment, these creatures are surviving digging deep into the cow dung for safety. But what will Craig do if chemicals have to be used on a large scale at Sherwood Farm? Traditionell bekämpft man die Heuschrecken mit Chemikalien, mit Insektiziden. Aber diese Insektizide haben natürlich Nebenwirkungen. Sie treffen alle Insekten. Sie stören das Ökosystem äh, ziemlich stark. Und diese Gifte werden von äh, möglichen Fressfeinden, äh, also Vögeln und so weiter, dann aufgenommen und auch diese Tiere sterben dann oder erleiden große Schäden. Man, man richtet also mit diesen Giften dann doch erhebliche Schäden im Umweltsystem an.
that there's a ray of hope. Researchers have discovered that a particular scent is responsible for making locusts swarm. That scent is the signal for locusts to begin laying waste to the countryside. If the combination of chemicals in this scent can be broken down, it could be used to confuse the locusts. That's what the scientists are hoping to do. Here, they're preparing their first experiments. Gas chromatography will be used to measure and distinguish the different scents that the locusts give off. The air around the insects is sampled over a period of several hours. Then it is analyzed with very sensitive instruments. Next, they have to measure which of the scents they've obtained are perceptible to the locusts. They use a very special method. One antenna, the equivalent of a nose for a locust, is cut off. Suspended in a special frame, the antenna remains alive for a few hours, while the locust makes do with a single antenna. Now, selected scent particles are blown past the antenna onto the measuring device. Variations in the electric current signal which scents the locust would respond to. But this is just the beginning. Now they have to find out how a locust responds to the same smell. Is it a signal that triggers eating, reproduction or flight? Or does it tell locusts to swarm? The experiments go on. No one in Victoria was expecting the plague of locusts. It caught everyone off guard. The farmers have now decided to get rid of the locusts themselves. As you can see, there's still millions of them in this gully, so hopefully what I've just done will uh, fix them up very shortly. Otherwise, uh, they're fixing the grass up very quickly as I go now. And uh, as it seems to be that the last two days are starting to fly, which is a shame. It'll be very hard to control now. It's imperative to kill as many of the locusts as they can before they start to fly, to swarm. If the locusts spread to distant farms, they will land, lay eggs once again, and swarm in even greater numbers. Craig has taken advice and chosen a chemical insecticide that is supposed to do as little widespread damage as possible. He hopes his dung beetles will survive and that his cattle and horses and his family have nothing to fear. But the experts have warned him that he must kill the vast majority of the locusts. Otherwise, they will recover and continue breeding in even greater numbers. Wayne Burnett isn't giving up either. The locusts he can't reach with his tractor, he's destroying on foot. Wayne has had a tough time. Drought, bushfires, torrential downpours, soil erosion, infestations. If he has another year like the previous one, when the locust plague left him too little grass to feed his cattle, he'll have to give up.
probably knock them on the head a bit, but I think it'll be an ongoing thing for quite some years to a next serious drought. <laughs> That's probably the only thing that'll stop them now. So, um, yeah, no, it's, let's hope we don't. I think we'll have them, but let's hope we don't have them as bad as we did this year. We can suffer a few thousand. Just like with the with the weather. They will carry on about greenhouse, but the weather changes every couple hundred years, so it's just natural. No matter how hard the farmers fight the pests, the weather can throw out all their calculations. Their farms are in a large valley where there's barely any wind. If luck goes against them, the sheltered location can mean that the swarming locusts will be unable to leave the valley. Ancient Egypt was very different from Australia. For much of the population, the plague of locusts meant famine. Few people had reserves of grain, and their animals had nothing to eat either. The locust swarms destroyed the livelihood of a society that was totally dependent on farming. And so the damage would have been huge. And, and the Bible says even the leaves on the trees were eaten. And I think this is right, and we observe this today in, in modern plagues of locusts. Modern plagues of locusts, there's just no real defense. You, you can try and burn them, uh, and I guess today you can drop uh, burning material from planes, but of course, if you do that and you burn the locusts, you're burning the, the food underneath the locusts as well, so it destroys the food anyway. Africa. Nightmarish scenes from the Third World. Scenes of desolation that are all too familiar for tens of millions of people. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization tries to help with practical suggestions. For example, to dig ditches to cut off the advancing columns of locusts before they get wings. As soon as enough funds are raised from abroad, planes are loaded with poison, as much as money can buy. But not even thousands of litres of highly toxic insecticide will destroy a really big swarm. The areas covered by the swarms are simply too large and the means available are too limited. And then, there are the side effects. But the scientists refuse to give up. They are convinced there must be ways of defeating locusts without poisoning the land at the same time. This is the next stage of the experiment, locking locusts in scent chambers to capture larger quantities of the scents they emit. The aim remains the same, to test the smells on other locusts. Locusts use smell to communicate, that is, they speak by emitting a scent. Right now, 
They're isolating PAN, phenylacetonitrate, the substance that apparently makes locusts swarm. But Professor Ferenc and his team discover that this substance has a quite different use, to deceive other locusts. Sexually mature males produce PAN to make females they're mated with invisible, that is, uninteresting to other males. They are trying to guarantee that the female will be impregnated by their sperm carrying their genes. The scientists want to try the same thing with synthetic PAN. One drop of the artificially synthesized scent is applied to a female that has not yet mated. It works. The male ignores the female. Das behandelte Weibchen, das wird jetzt vom Männchen gemieden. Das zeigt uns also natürlich in der Tat ganz wunderbar, dass, dass, dass es sich bei diesem Pheromon um einen Abwehrstoff handelt. Wunderbar, sehr schön. Das Weibchen verhält sich ganz bilderbuchmäßig. Ja, kommen jetzt erstmal durch. Ja. Duftstoffe verhalten sich im Freiland dann sicherlich etwas anders, als wir das im Labor hier simulieren können. Die Umweltbedingungen sind dann natürlich völlig andere. Aber wir könnten uns vorstellen, dass man mit diesem Duftstoff Verwirrung stiftet im Fortpflanzungsverhalten. Das heißt, die Männchen wissen dann nicht mehr, wo ist ein Weibchen, wo finde ich einen geeigneten Partner, weil, weil es überall nach Abwehrstoff riecht und überall nach Männchen duftet. Und, so werden die Männchen dann also einfach nicht willig sein, ein Weibchen zu suchen und mit dem sich zu paaren. But this approach has one drawback. It has to be applied before the locusts mate. So you have to know in plenty of time where the locusts are, how many there are and their stage of development. the Institute for Remote Sensing in Graz, Austria. It may sound strange, but observation from space can help, even though the resolution of standard satellite photographs is far too crude to spot individual insects. Ein Insekt, beispielsweise eine Heuschrecke, wird etwa diese Größe haben und äh, bei einer Bildelementgröße, das heißt Pixelgröße von 60 bis 70 cm, kann man selbstverständlich ein einzelnes Insekt nicht erkennen. Sondern äh, was wir erkennen können, sind eben diese Fraßschäden oder eben diese Schäden, die sie verursachen. Und hier kann man sehr schön in Rotfärbung eben diese Auswirkung einer solchen Insektenkalamität sehen. Das, was wir mit unserem menschlichen Auge wahrnehmen, ist nur die halbe Wahrheit. Es gibt noch äh, viel mehr Wellenlängen. Infrarot zeigt im Prinzip, die Menge und auch den Gesundheitszustand von Biomasse. This infrared satellite picture can display healthy areas in green and decimated areas in reddish brown. Above all, we can see the weather by satellite. That's more important than we might think. Locust swarms fly to places where they can find lush green vegetation, places where it has rained, they cannot choose where to go, but the weather guides them. Locusts have an amazing ability to sense the weather in advance. The prerequisites for a swarm are sunshine and warmth. Locusts don't swarm at under 19 degrees centigrade. Es ist so, dass Schwärme immer dann synchron gleichzeitig aufbrechen, wenn 
die Temperaturen angeeignet sind. Also das ist in der Regel so am späten Vormittag der Fall. Und dann starten diese Schwärme und fliegen dann los. Sie werden vom Wind getragen. Sie fliegen mit dem Wind und nicht gegen den Wind. Das können diese Heuschrecken nicht. Sie sind tolle Flieger. Sie können also mit ihrem Seesystem sehr gut manövrieren und stoßen also nicht in der Luft einfach zusammen. Auch das ist also hocheffizient bei diesen Heuschrecken ausgeprägt. Die Heuschrecken nutzen einfach die Tatsache, dass der Wind sich in der Regel von einem Hoch in, zu einem Tiefdruckgebiet bewegt. Und Tiefdruck bedeutet dann immer ein, in der Regel ein Regengebiet oder ein Gebiet, in dem es geregnet hat. Es ist also sehr sinnvoll, mit diesen Luftströmungen sich zu bewegen, weil man dann dahin kommt, wo, wo man Eier ablegen kann und wo dann die Nachkommen wahrscheinlich gute Entwicklungsbedingungen finden, weil es geregnet hat und dort Vegetation sich entwickelt, die dann gefressen werden kann. The greener the vegetation, the greater the danger of a swarm as soon as rain falls. That's certainly the case in Australia. When there's rain after a long drought and the fields are a lush green, that's when locusts become active. The individual farmer's efforts have not been enough. The hoppers have grown noticeably bigger and are coming closer and closer to towns. The Victorian government launches its counter-attack. The helicopters are loading up with poisons designed to spare the environment. As a precaution, all roads leading into the treatment areas are closed. The chemicals are supposed to be harmless for humans and animals, but you never know. The helicopters are normally used to fight bushfires. The sharp blade in front of the cockpit is to cut high tension wires before they get caught up in the rotor. Every year there are accidents with low flying helicopters. Ground teams cover the territory before the helicopters arrive. They check the terrain, pinpointing the targets for spraying, and report on the wind conditions. These smoke streams give the best indication of wind speed and direction. They're to make sure that the poison lands in the right place. The helicopters always fly in formation to aid navigation while flying low. What the helicopters release isn't a liquid, but a fine spray. This reduces the use of chemicals by 99% and so protects the environment. But if there's a sudden wind shift, the poison cloud may miss its target altogether.
The pilots respond to detailed information from the farmers and the field officers. They avoid open water and herds of animals. They're aiming at the hopper bands, the black lines of locusts in the grass. Just the house or the barn? Now the the house, the the house. They fly over the insects as low as possible and at just the right angle, hoping that the wind will carry the insecticide in the right direction. After a few hours, Craig Lloyd has given the green light to let his cattle back into the paddocks. He hopes the poison has already dispersed and presents no danger to his cattle. But he must also hope that the dose was potent enough to kill the locusts and that it caught enough of them. The next day, he goes out to see for himself. I was sprayed here 24 hours ago. Uh, the, the chief men of uh, the Locust Commission tell us that we have to kill 97% of them, otherwise we're going backwards. I'm hoping that um, this time next year we might have killed the bulk of them, but I've got my doubts. In spite of all our technology and research, we are still a long way from overcoming the locust threat. Thousands of years ago, the ancient Egyptians had no technology at all for fighting locusts. They had to surrender to their fate. Even Pharaoh begged for mercy. And the Lord turned a mighty, strong west wind which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. In the ancient world, they were much more accustomed than we are, that when uh, natural conditions are tough, and they just accepted this, this was a, a way of life, as it were. They were all part of nature. They would see animals dying all the time, and then humans would die when there were plagues or when there were famines, and this was just something that they had to accept and they couldn't do very much about. The plague of locusts was not a direct threat to all of Egypt. It could only destroy the harvest. The wealthy men of Egypt, Pharaoh's courtiers, knew they had full stores of corn. So the plague of locusts mainly affected the poor. But the locusts were not to be the final plague. 